really think intersectionality helps us understand our current political dilemmas. Mm -hmm. And I think it's evolving as a theory. I think it's a pretty relatively new set of ideas, mm -hmm. but many of us are winners in some respects and losers in, the, in others. Yes, there's some people who are at the bottom of every single hierarchy that's ever been imagined. Yeah. And there's some who are at the very, very top. Mm -hmm. And if we look at them, we see that they often, those at the very, very bottom, the very, very, very top, have very similar characteristics. Those at the top tend to be from rich countries. Uh, they tend to be white and they tend to be male mm -hmm. and they tend to own capital, right? Mm -hmm. At the other extreme, the mirror image of that. But a lot of us are in between. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, you know, we're winners in some respects and we're losers in others. And so that means when we think about how to allocate our time and energy in collective action, mm -hmm. we, we might want to advance the interests of uh, our group, but we belong to many groups. So the strategic dilemma is pretty great. Hello, I'm Jayati Ghosh. I teach economics at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst in the US. And before that, I've been teaching for three and a half decades in Jawaharlal Nehru University in India. Today, I'm really delighted to be able to talk to Nancy Fulbray, professor at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst as well, about her new book, The Rise and Decline of Patriarchal Systems, an Intersectional Political Economy. Nancy Fulbray is well known to many people as one of the founders, really, of a, a branch of economics, which I hesitate to call feminist economics because I really think it should be called human economics. So, Nancy, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thank you so much, Jaddy. I can't think of anyone I would rather be interviewed by. Oh, wow. I love that. So thank you for that. So, Nancy, can you begin by just telling us uh, in this book what exactly I mean, I'm not going to ask what you were going to try to do because it's it's huge. I think the canvas you've taken on is enormous. But I think what is really striking is how you have picked on care as this fundamental concept that affects how economies are organized and what patriarchal systems are really all about. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, you know, historically, economics has really focused on the production of commodities, on things that are bought and sold in markets. But the economy really depends on human capabilities. And those human capabilities have to be produced, they have to be developed, uh, and they have to be maintained. And um, I think we need to reverse the lens and think about the production of human capabilities as our end goal. Um, gross domestic product is an input into that, uh, rather than seeing workers as an input into the production of things that are bought and sold. And so I define care very much in those terms as involving the creation and the development and also the maintenance of human capabilities. So not just children, but um, people who are experiencing sickness or disability or the frailty of old age. You know, this is um, a really central process and uh, we can't just leave it up to nature or leave it up to kind of culture or leave it up to um, preferences. We have to think about how it's organized because its organization, like the organization of commodity production, involves both cooperation and conflict and collective conflict between men and women, between rich and poor, between citizens of rich countries and poor countries. All of those dimensions of collective conflict have an influence on the allocation of resources to Care. You know, that's it's so fascinating to hear you put it this way in terms of this sort of, you know, dilemma between conflict and cooperation within societies, which in turn determines uh, really how care is distributed and who performs the care. But one of the other very fascinating insights, I think, in your book is really about the nature of care, about how it's different from other activities and that the very performance of care somehow reduces if you like, the social bargaining power of those who are doing it? Well, you know, care really requires some uh, identification with and concern for the well-being of the, the person being cared for. And also, it's not standardized. It has to be, um, you know, tailored to responding to um, the particular needs of an individual person. In fact, you could... E even think of care as something that's co-produced by 
the person receiving it and the person giving it. So if you're a teacher, you need um, you need your students to do the to do the work, to do the homework, to do the reading. And if they don't, you're not a successful teacher. Uh, if you're a doctor, you need to persuade your patient um, to be mindful of. Um, the ways to promote good health and to, to follow the best um, guidance and instruction in that whole process. Uh, you know, the challenge of parenting is to persuade children uh, to do things that are good good for them, you know, without um, without resorting to th uh, threats or, or completely authoritarian uh, parenting. So it, it really involves the creation of cooperative attachments between people. And that in itself makes it d difficult for people to just, you know, enter and exit freely uh, and go from one relationship to another because you, you know, uh, at attachment itself is is sticky. Um, and once you become attached to people who need your assistance, it's very hard to threaten to, to withdraw it. There's that wonderful phrase in your book that, you know, basically the caregivers, that you care about those whom you are caring for. And then that in turn, as you say, because it affects your ability to withdraw it, means that you have less bargaining power. Yeah, and, and I think I think people, ordinary people really experience this in a lot of ways. Like, sometimes I think we realize that we're likely to become attached um, to people who need our help. And we kind of preemptively avoid putting ourselves in a situation where we might form that attachment because we know that it will be... Uh, costly. You know, if you go on a vacation, a lot of times you don't want to be on a vacation around people who are, are, you know, where you see or have to, you know, have contact with people who are really needy, who are really, um, uh, are really deprived. You want to, you want to shut that out because you know, if you see it, you'll, you'll feel the need to help out. So I think there's this, you know, it's not just that people get attached. It's also that that that, that we often have elaborate ways of preventing ourselves of, yeah. from getting attached to people who we think might be too needy. But but then there's also this very profound point that essentially empathy therefore under underlies the economic order. That economies use empathy. Yes. To generate care. Yeah? Yes, empathy is is really required. Uh, but in general, I would say also there's a sense in which a lot of social institutions impose obligations on groups of people to provide this empathy. And it's not, it's not as though the natural force of empathy is sufficient to solve the problem. It has to be kind of reinforced and channeled by, by social institutions. And I think that's one of the reasons that patriarchal systems emerge is that they, they are, are, are systems that basically channel and reinforce uh, the distribution of caring commitments, um, often basically requiring women uh, to devote much more time and energy to care uh, than men. And that is at the heart, in many ways, of women's reduced bargaining power. You know, there are these four concepts that economists use all the time, particularly, I would say, Marxist or socialist economists who use these concepts that you unpack, and I think you brilliantly dissect, which once you look at care from this particular vantage point, production, uh, mode of production, social reproduction, exploitation, I think you really do unpack. Can you explain a little bit, for example, production? How does that change once we incorporate this particular notion? Well, I think it becomes bigger. Uh, instead of being just about the production of things, it becomes about the production of people. Mm -hmm. And then not just the production of people, but also the production of the, the, the relationships and the institutions that enable people to, to cooperate with one another. Um, so I guess I think the, the traditional Marxian emphasis on surplus value and the creation mm -hmm. of a surplus is just, it's too simple. Uh, as though, you know, um, you can just easily distinguish the seed corn from the corn you have to consume, mm -hmm. uh, from the surplus corn that's left over. In fact, for many years, I used to teach Marxian economics using this piles of corn analogy, you know. And uh, the more I taught it, the more I realized it was really, you know, too simple to think about surplus mm -hmm. in terms of a physical product. I mean, 
another way to put it is that you know population growth itself is a kind of surplus mm -hmm. uh if you are accumulating more creating more people over time mm -hmm. uh creating more resources in terms of, of population and human capital that that too is a form of surplus and i think that's a real challenge to the way the the word production is traditionally deployed and then that feeds into the whole mode of production thing you know where we tend to think in these rather simplistic as you've mentioned movements between you know the primitive kinds of things to slavery to feudalism to capitalism yeah because that that centering of the productive technology became kind of the the um the way to define the stages of history you know hunter gatherers to sedentary agriculture mm -hmm. to uh, feudal systems to capitalist systems, et cetera, et cetera. And don't get me wrong, I, I think productive technologies have a big impact. And mm -hmm. I, I've been very influenced by the theory of historical materialism, mm -hmm. um, which I think really uh, emphasizes kind of an evolutionary dynamic uh, and dialectic by which societies change over time. But instead of thinking about how things are produced, I think we should think more about institutions of collective power. So I'm kind of bringing collective power to the fore and saying, let's look at the social institutions that give some groups power over others. And for instance, the ways in which patriarchal institutions give adult men power over women and children, but also to ask how those institutions are related to class, institutions of class power and institutions of racial, ethnic power, and many, many other forms of collective power. And I think it's the way in which these different structures kind of interact and interlock and sometimes conflict with one another that's really a, a, the key to understanding the historical com complexity, as it were. That's kind of central in your understanding of exploitation as well, isn't it? That you're really bringing in the fact of this power, which is sometimes compounded by cultural mores and, and different kinds of social norms and so on. So what, how does that differ from the standard sort of Marxian notion of exploitation? Well, you know, the standard Marxian notion of exploitation is the appropriation of surplus value in production. So it's a very production centric notion. And, you know, Marxian uh, theorists have always been, uh, no, not always, but have often been very sympathetic to struggles against inequality based on gender, race, uh, national identity, so forth and so on, but have always sort of relegated them, have always sort of seen them as political or cultural or identity politics and or not as economic. But I think if you, if you, if your focus is on collective bargaining power, um, it's possible to define exploitation as uh, something that emerges when one group has enough collective bargaining power to claim a larger share of the gains from cooperation uh, than they otherwise would have. Uh, and, you know, that general definition kind of subsumes the traditional Marxian theory of exploitation, which holds that capitalists have the power to extract surplus value mm -hmm. because of the way in which they use the state to expropriate common property and, and common access mm -hmm. to the means of production. So it's, it's really kind of a generalization uh, of that principle. So you could see that, why, you know, what, like a patriarchal law, like denying women property rights, gives men and women still cooperate but men are able to claim a disproportionate share of the gains from cooperation because uh, they have that institutional bargaining power that comes from laws, from ownership of property, and from also from cultural norms. You know, I think this actually leads immediately to something that many people ask about intersectionality. It's very clear to me that your concept is a much more profound concept than simply saying, oh, people have different identities and, and all of that. You're really making a much broader point about the interplay of these economic and social and cultural processes, aren't you? Well, I, you know, I really think intersectionality helps us understand our current political dilemmas in, 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 in some really... Uh, some really crucial ways. Mm -hmm. And I think it's evolving as a theory. I think it's a pretty relatively new set of ideas. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I guess I like to frame it as um, uh, an emphasis on the fact that we're all, not all, but many of us 
are winners in some respects and losers in others. Yes, there's some people who are at the bottom of every single hierarchy that's ever been imagined. Yeah. And there's some who are at the very, very top. Mm -hmm. And if we look at them, we see that they often, those at the very, very bottom, the very, very, very top, have very similar characteristics. Those at the top tend to be from rich countries. Uh, they tend to be white and they tend to be male mm -hmm. and they tend to own capital, right? Mm -hmm. At the other extreme, the mirror image of that. But a lot of us are in between. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, you know, we're winners in some respects and we're losers in others. And so that means when we think about how to allocate our time and energy in collective action, mm -hmm. we, we might want to advance the interests of uh, our group, but we belong to many groups. So the strategic dilemma is pretty great. And if you're, if you're advantaged in a significant way among one dimension, you might be very reluctant to challenge um, another dimension in which you're actually at a disadvantage. I think because people are really afraid of loss, of any loss of position is, is generally more painful than failure to, to gain something. Mm -hmm. I think intersectionality helps explain why um, hierarchical systems are so stable because a lot of people in the middle are very uh, reluctant to challenge a structure that might be destabilized in a way uh, that means the net their net benefits might might be reduced. You know, you're right that thinking about it in this way really does transform even how you look at political changes and, and many of these things. But then I suppose people would ask you, what explains the optimism of your title, the decline of patriarchal systems, oh. <laughs> which you also talk well, about in some of yeah. your chapters? <laughs> yeah, well, well, I mean, I think that's that's so important to look at the other side of it. Um, and I think uh, just remember that's the nature of complex systems, that they 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 have contradictory effects. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that was a, a really key element of the Marxian analysis of capitalism, that in many respects it was a progressive force that developed technological change and that kind of undermined the feudal order. Uh, but it also had a, a downside in terms of its... Uh, um, in terms of its exploitative aspects and its, mm -hmm. and its sort of vulnerability to crisis, right? So, uh, I, you know, my take on capitalism is very, is very similar, actually, to mm -hmm. the, you know, to that vision. I would, rather than emphasizing sort of the way in which capitalism uh, displaced and undermined feudal relations, I would say capitalism tends to destabilize some patriarchal relations. And in fact, patriarchal and feudal institutions often go together. But, you know, one of the things that the, the technological dynamism of capitalism does is it undermines the family as a unit of production. It means that production moves outside the family uh, to uh, the factory, to the firm, capitalist firm. And as a result, it kind of undermines patriarchal control over women and children um, to the extent that that was based on kind of ownership of, of property or control over, over um, uh, a commons. And so the younger generation begins to gain some independence uh, from parents and women begin to gain some alternatives to marriage and complete specialization in the, mm -hmm. in the, in the family division of labor. And that has some very liberating aspects uh, for women, uh, especially women who are less encumbered by reproductive responsibilities and care responsibilities. So uh, I think uh, single white women with access to education living in rich countries have made enormous gains. So there's this intersectional kind mm -hmm. of unevenness to the uh, destabilization of patriarchal uh, institutions. Uh, but it also has a kind of a cultural and normative spillover effect. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we're still trying to understand exactly how, uh, to, you know, to what extent um, uh, capitalist development is undermining some patriarchal institutions and yet reinforcing others. And in particular, I think capitalism tends to reinforce the idea that women are uh, are responsible for care, mm -hmm. and that care does not need to be socialized, publicly supported, uh, publicly recognized, or rewarded. So, 
Yeah, I may be optimistic in talking about the decline, <laughs> but I see, I see, I see at least a, a possibility of it tipping, you know, tipping in a downward direction. So, you know, you're probably right in the northern kind of context, it, but, you know, in most developing countries, many of us see it going the other way, actually, that you're getting a reinforcement of the, the worst kinds of patriarchal norms and gains made are often destroyed, uh, not just by, you know, political changes, but even by economic, well, by neoliberalism, which forces more and more onto households. Well, and, I think... And, yeah. I think that's absolutely true. And, and I think um, one of the things I try to emphasize in my, in my book is that the form that capitalist development has taken in uh, less developed countries is very, very different. Uh, it, it, there has not been a big expansion of wage employment. Mm -hmm. uh, there has not been a big growth in opportunities for independent uh, employment outside the mm -hmm. home. There's been a huge ballooning of informal sector employment that is very unstable and, you know, very, very marginalized uh, and not something that really gives those who participate in it very, very much economic independence or, or bargaining power. What I would argue is you could see that as kind of a failure of capitalism or an insufficiency of capitalism, you know, that this idea that the capitalist development would be uh, uh, an ex inexorable force for, for um, advancing living standards on a global level has really proven uh, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty false, uh, you know, because it's we've seen a tremendous concentration of wealth. That means that um, I don't know. Do you, we could call it a global capitalist system, uh, but in a way, it's 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 a more complex system where uh, capitalism in in rich countries uh, has delivered significant increases in living standards, but you know, elsewhere, uh, yeah. not so clear. Which I suppose would link with the kind of global imbalances of economic power and political power and, and imperialism broadly, which would bring in another kind of intersectionality too. I think, but you know, even in the developing world, I think one of the things that you mentioned in, in your later chapters in terms of the importance of coalitions and the importance of looking beyond your own specific thing for larger social movements is still so important and so necessary. I think that um, whenever, uh, whenever really serious global problems emerge that clearly require cooperation mm -hmm. uh, rather than competition, you see the emergence of new coalitions. Mm -hmm. And I think the COVID-19 pandemic uh, is so transparently a global problem uh, that markets themselves cannot really address uh, that it it's it's kind of uh, created a, ba a basis for mm -hmm. new kinds of coalitions. But also, I think cl climate change uh, mm -hmm. is another very important global mm -hmm. threat. It really requires cooperation, cooperation and collaboration on a global level that we have never achieved in the past. And um, I would like to think that that's going to be a real impetus to rethinking a lot of the institutional mm -hmm. um, arrangements that we've we've relied on uh, yeah. during a period of economic growth where we had the luxury of ignoring um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, effects on our social environment and our physical uh, uh, environment, our natural environment. I, I'm sure all of you realize how fascinating Nancy's book is, if this is just a small flavor of the many, many insights and the rich tapestry that she weaves in this book. So if this hasn't got you interested in reading this book, I don't know what will, but I assure you it's really worth it. Thank you so much, Nancy, for joining Jayani, me. thank you for your optimism on all fronts. <laughs>